You're listening to the Race at a Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out Race92.com to see the many different racing merchandise options we offer. I'm your co-host, Aaron McAtee, our other co-host. You may have seen him walking out of a great club with a big old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. He is the man, the myth, the legend, Scott Bowie. How do you do, Aaron? I'm doing great. So we have a great interview for this week's episode um, with Marco Greco. And I think everyone I think everyone will really enjoy that. And I, I knew the Marco Greco interview would be great, but it definitely exceeded my expectations. Yeah, Marco really gets in depth to a lot of things. Um, and he's very, very open. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be some big surprises in there if yeah. you're – a fan of IndyCar and some kind of surprising things that kind of happened in during his career. Um, so yeah, it, like you said, man, it, this, this interview was, I thought it'd be good, but it was, it was way more than even I expected. Oh, absolutely. And Marco, Marco's a great guy. I mean, he's a big family man, um, you know, real close with his family, his mother, you know, he talks a lot about that. And, um, you know, you can tell he was very passionate about racing. He owned his own team for a couple of years, which I had no I had no idea um, before we did the interview that he owned his own team. So that was really interesting to hear about. And, you know, like Scott said, I think everyone will really enjoy enjoy the interview and, you know, hearing some of these things that will probably come. It's pretty surprising to a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, some of the things are very surprising, uh, very, I mean, some things behind the scenes that. Kind of shocking in some cases. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess talking a little bit about, um, so this past weekend um, was the IndyCar Grand Prix Indianapolis. Um, and, you know, like like all year, it's it's great to see new people won. And, you know, this, this weekend definitely didn't disappoint with that, with Renus VK getting his first win. Um, you know, definitely a lot of emotion there. He was definitely very excited. His parents were here. Um, you know, they, they got to see it. So, you know, it's, it's great, you know, seeing, you know, new faces like that win. And I think, you know, I think it may be, you know, kind of the, the chains of the guard in IndyCar, so to speak. Yeah. The youth movement, like we discussed, uh, previous shows, the youth movement is in full swing in IndyCar. I mean, Scott Dixon still leading the point. Scott Dixon still maximizing everything he can get out of a car. Um, and Scott Dixon is not going anywhere anytime soon. But you've got these young guys who are elbowing their way into uh, the top five, you know, and elbowing their way into victory lane. And uh, it, like you said, the change in the guard is here. And it's a, it's a great group of racers, too. It's not um, – it, it isn't just one or two. I mean, there's several guys who can get the job done. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, leading into May, um, the first practice is this week. Um, we'll release this episode um, most likely on Wednesday. So we'll have at least one full day of practice already going on. Um, but, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, who, who's going to be competitive for the 500. And I think obviously Dixon, um, you know, he, he's going to be up there. And but, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, Pato, Palou, um, and Rena's, I think they're all, you know, going to be competitive. And I mean, the 500 is one race where, you know, there's 15 guys that could easily win it. Well, Rena's is a pit stop away from being in the hunt last year at the end. Yep. Um, and, but that's uh, the story of Indy, right? Right. Uh, there's that. There's something about the 500 miles of Indy where there's a pit stop here or something there uh, that, you know, if the race was 400 miles, there'd be a lot. A lot of different names on the board, oh, Warner. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that these, you know, again, these guys are young, but they do have a year underneath their belt. Um, even Pato, who, you know, uh, I guess this would be his second one, or is this his first, his second Indy 500? Did he run last year? Um, that's, that's a good question. I should know this. Um, he did not run last year. Well, I thought, so he missed, he missed the show. One oh, no, he did win. La- no, he started. No, he raced last year. That's right, and he yeah. and, and he ran last year, and he was teammate to Oliver Askew. Yep, it was and, 2019 with um when he was teammates with Alonzo. Yeah, the whole Carlin racing deal when he did not make it. 
Right. So, you know, he's got a year of, of this race under his belt. Like I said, Renus does. Uh, you know, don't look now. Graham Ray Hall has quietly had a great season. Yeah. And Graham Ray Hall quietly had a great race at the Grand Prix. And anybody who's counting Graham Ray Hall out for this 500, uh, until I see something that proves it different, I'm going to tell you, I think Graham Ray Hall may surprise some people uh, come the final Sunday of May this year. Right. And his teammate is obviously going to be fast as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but again, no, there's a lot of other guys and, and these guys, mm-hmm. Scott McLaughlin, probably yeah. a year, you, you know, we're, we're looking at maybe a year to get acclimated and to, you know, to really run the 500, but you know, next year, uh, he could, he, he will definitely be in the hunt as well. So this, these next few years, man, they're going to be interesting. They're going to be competitive. Right. Absolutely. Um, so obviously, you know, we're kind of previewing the 500 now, but, um, so, so next week, um, after this episode, we're going to look at doing a, um, Indy 500 preview show. We're still kind of working out the details for that. Um, so definitely something to look forward to. Um, we're going to try to get some special guests to be a part of that. Um, and then we're looking right now at releasing, um, at least two to three, um, new podcast episodes next week. Um, with former Indy 500 drivers, um, and those are also going to be very, very um, interesting as well. And I think everyone will enjoy those, and definitely some really good ones. Um, we're looking at releasing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we've, we've uh, been stocking these up to try to you know to be able to release them during this this time period. Uh, some really insightful uh, interviews. I feel um, I shouldn't really call them interviews. I, I just like hearing people's stories more than an interview. But uh, I think they're pretty insightful and you get a good idea how these people think and how they approach things. And what you're going to see, and you're going to see this across the entire board, I think, with any, especially Indy 500 driver, is one of the first things they mention is how competitive they are. Yep. And this is through every one of these guys that we've discussed, you know, that we've talked to. Uh, they are the ones that bring up the word competitive. Yep, and another thing you'll notice is, you know, how th- the emotion, you know, they have when they talk about what indie means to them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's not surprising to hear that. Uh, it is, um, it's interesting, I, I think, because, you know, some of these guys have done a lot of racing around mm-hmm. the world. And to hear them talk about Indianapolis, you know, it just shows you the magnitude of what that race is. And, and, uh, we actually just did an interview with a driver who mentioned, uh, his big three are Monaco, uh, Monaco Le Mans and Indy. And he feels like Indy is most likely the most, his favorite race because mm-hmm. the importance of it. Uh, he said, you know, Monaco to him was a uh, important race because the opulence of it, you know, right. the, the, how grand it is and what an event it is. So, um, it's, it's going to be, uh, the, these upcoming podcasts we're really proud of, and, and we were so excited, uh, not only before we discussed these people, we were really excited after we talked with them because, oh, yeah. you know, they, they share a lot of things with us that some of it's a little surprising. Mm-hmm. And, and with, you know, a lot of these podcasts, we try to get a whole, a full spectrum of people. So we have people that were, we interviewed a couple of people that were very competitive in Indy, one of them got the pull in Indy. Um, and then, you know, someone else we talked to, um, you know, started on the last row and, you know, it was, it was a win for, it was a small team and it was a win for them just to make the race. So right. definitely, you know, I really wanted to give people a full kind of spectrum of, you know, what it's like, you know, on the top and then what's like, you know, kind of on the bottom. Yeah. I mean, uh, and I, I think too, when you talk about that is some of the stories when they discuss, was like starting in the back and right, how right. Uh, hectic that can be. Right. No, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so definitely something to look forward to for next week. Um, we're still kind of working out the details for that, like I said, but without any further ado, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get right into the Marco Greco interview and hopefully um, it does not disappoint anyone. Definitely did not disappoint me. Didn't disappoint me either. Our guest today started racing in Grand Prix motorcycle racing. 
1988, he raced in Formula 3000 before making his way over to American Open Wheel Racing in 1993. He competed in four Indy 500s. We are joined by Marco Greco. Hey, Marco, how's it going? Very well, thank you. How about you guys? Going oh, well. Great. Yeah, doing great. Nice to meet you, Marco. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you so much um, for um, joining us. So you, so you had a pretty diverse racing career. I mean, you started racing motorcycles, and then you came over to America and did open wheel racing. How? So how did you get interested in racing, and what kind of well, racing were you first interested in? I, I was uh, uh, seven years old, mm -hmm. and uh, I crossing. I was crossing a street with uh, a cousin of mine, and uh, came by on the street. Uh, a car with a go-kart on the top. And I say, wow, what is this? He say, this is a go-kart. <laughs> I say, well, that's what I want to do in my life. So from there on, uh, I started competing in uh, kart racing. And uh, I was national champion in a formula. It was a, a bike engine, mm -hmm. 175 cc. And uh, it's like a design, like a formula. It was actually very fast, two-stroke. And then uh, when I was uh, 12 years old, I switched to a motorcycle because my cousin used to be uh, one of the most important riders in, in Brazil. But uh, in the end of the day, uh, uh, he, he died in the street, racing uh, in a racing street. So that was incredible, crazy. He was uh, 23 years old and... Uh, I was 14, and I was following the same way he was doing, you know, mm -hmm. racing the streets, and uh, uh, every week I was, uh, you know, going home with the friends because uh, I was hurting in, in, in a crash, and uh, so, uh, but after his uh, crash, I say, I, I was there afterwards, my father took me there, and uh, I said, wow, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's not a, a real death of uh, glory you know this is a stupid thing and i don't want to do that i want to be world champion and and then uh, i stop uh, doing that and uh, concentrate so i make uh, 10 titles in brazil of uh, motorcycle i won 10 titles uh, i was the first one who do uh, grand prix 500 uh, on the same time kenny roberts uh, fred spencer mamola and all these guys. My last year in motorcycle, I raced at the AMA. Uh, I have a, a friend, uh, Steve McLaughlin, who, who actually used to race a motorcycle, and he was the, the guy who organized super bikes. And he was the one who invited me, oh, you have to come here, you know, leave the Grand Prix now, because if you can get the factory bike from Honda to race here, it would be great. So, I did the Formula One on that time. I was racing uh, Wayne Rainey, uh, Kevin Schwanz, uh, Cork Ballington, four times world champion, uh, Handy Hanfro, who already uh, passed away. And uh, my first race, I finished third and then fifth. Then I had a crash and, and, and uh, I finished nine in the finish of the championship. Then I went to the last race. Uh, uh, in Misano Adriatico from the World Championship, and I thought that I was going to do great there because I have a good bike. And on that time, first time that I had the special tires that uh, normally only the factory bikes and some other guys had uh, the same tires that make three seconds difference from one to the other. It was unbelievable. But then uh, when I arrived there uh, on the straight, you know, going out of the corner. Mike Baldwin passed me in one wheel. I said, what the heck I'm doing here? <laughs> <laughs> because there is no competition here. You know, it's completely different. And that's one of the reasons uh, I switched to cars. But before that, then uh, Japan, Honda Japan asked me to go to Japan to, to test the bike from uh, Winnie Gardner. And, and it was a V4 and I was racing with a V3. I say, okay, I go there, but only if uh, you guys promise me to give me the bikes to do the World Championship. And they say, well, we cannot do that. We can give you a 7% better bike for the World Championship uh, of uh, 1987. And then uh, I follow, you know, my feelings that uh, 
even Ayrton always was my friend and Ayrton Senna. And mm-hmm. he said, Marco, we race together in go-kart. So he said, live the, the, you know, the bikes. You are always crashing. And I, I, I meet you all the time in the airport with, with uh, you know, with some problems. So uh, <laughs> stop and go to four wheels. It will be great for you. I say, well, that's, I think, what I'm going to do because I was national champion go-kart. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, I transferred to, to, to cars. But then I went straight to Formula 3 in England. So that's... The, the place that is more competitive and the right, first was the most important on that time. Uh, but then I, I realized uh, that uh, it was going to be very difficult because when you look uh, uh, from world champions like uh, Giacomo Agostini, uh, Marco Lucinelli, who was the one who also in, uh, put me in the 500cc because I used to race at 350. Uh, all of them try very hard to get into Formula One, but uh, uh, the problem is it's a very different thing. When you go to motorcycle, to cars, the motorcycle have a very good acceleration, but you almost stop the bikes before the corner. And the cars, you know, especially the Formula cars that have downforce and all this, uh, it's very different. So your brain do not accept it. And when you look, there are only five guys who did the uh, motorcycle, GP bikes, and then went to cars and did the Formula One or as a test. I, I was a test driving Formula One for a, a small team called Fondi Metal. And uh, so you look at that. It's a, uh, Mike Haywood, I believe John Surtz, uh, Johnny Secotto, myself as a, as a test driver in Formula One. And uh, I believe a few read. So the rest who try, Uncini, Marco Lucinelli, Giacomo Agustin, they never could do it because it's a very different approach. Mm-hmm. And uh, so in Formula 3, it was difficult because there was uh, three cars on that year. I went to Magic Motorsport that was a good uh, team on, in England. But on that year, they had uh, three drivers for Formula 3, and they uh, had the first year in Formula 3000 with Andy Wallace. And all the effort was to Andy Wallace. So, and I was the one who arrived there <laughs> from nowhere. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, so it was very difficult. Then I get a chance. I, I was getting 12, 11th place. So then I get a chance with uh, Eddie Jordan, who we used to live close by. And he said, Marco, I have a car for you. If you wanted to do, you can do Brands Hatch with us and uh, live in Magic and see what we can, we can do. He said, okay. So I went there. And uh, on the first test, I was only three tenths uh, slower than Johnny Herbert. That was my teammate on that time. And everybody said, oh, oh, what's going on here? And on the race, I was the four fastest and finished six. And then on the following day at the Autosport magazine, Greco fly with Eddie Jordan, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so it's very different. Right. And, then, and then I make a comparison on, on, the, on the magazine. They say, what is the difference on the cars? I say, well, there is, you cannot compare. It's like a, a, a souffle, tomato souffle. <laughs> with uh, a shotgun. It's very different. You cannot compare. It's impossible <laughs> to compare. So from there on, then on the following year, uh, John Taranak, he, he signed with me for the route factory. I said, wow, now I, I can do well because on the year before, they was champion with uh, Gujomin from mm-hmm. Brazil. Mm-hmm. And uh, what happened is... Uh, there was a first year they were doing the chassis, carbon chassis. So all the, the problems they had with the, the suspension, they didn't have with the, the aluminum uh, monocoque because it uh, works with the suspension. 
Mm-hmm. And the situation right. was good. So I said, well, that, that's not a problem. They're going to resolve it because they are <laughs> in the factory. And, and they, I mean, Hunter, John Taranak, he, he did a lot of uh, work, changed a lot of things. We try a lot of things, even with Eric Bernard, who was uh, afterwards uh, uh, racing Formula One. And uh, I couldn't qualify. I couldn't oh, wow. qualify. Eric Bernard couldn't qualify every race. And mm-hmm. then also there was two more uh, drivers who try also at the team with us. No good. So uh, I say, well, I think uh, I am the same as the other, the most of the riders who did well riding bikes, but then goes to cars and it's no good. So I uh, did Jordan give me a chance to say, Marco, I say, well, I'm leaving to Brazil. I, I think I'm done. I'm, I'm not uh, able to do it. No, no, no! I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if it's you or the car. I'm gonna give you 20 laps at uh, Silverstone and uh, on the car from Alizy, and uh, we see how it goes. Unbelievable! After 12 laps, I was one tenth from the pole position. That was Guilherme and Pupo Moreno. We say, what the fuck? So <laughs> <laughs> we sign for the following year for the Formula 3000. First race, I broke the lap record from Brands Hatch and I was the pole position. And then I didn't even know how to, to uh, start the race because, uh, you know, it's a very different power and uh, the Brands Hatch is very tricky to, to start in the front row. So, but then, you know, uh, proves that uh, the team is very important. When you have a team behind you, it can help you a lot. Well, then after that, I was a testing driver for the Fondimato. I did the three testing and, and uh, Mr. Rumi then uh, had the cancer and, and he had a lot of problems. And uh, so, uh, Fittipaldi said, Marco, why don't you go to United States? Because there you have more chance to be happy than, you know, in a small team. Even with, uh, you know, guys uh, who, from the FOBMAT one, mm-hmm. uh, um, he, 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 he's the one who took me there with Eddie Jordan, you know, for the fundamental with Mr. Rumi. And uh, I said, well, okay, you can go. I think it'll be good. So I did the Indy Lights. Uh, I didn't finish all the season, but uh, first race I finished fourth, and then at Long Beach I finished fourth, so it was, was okay. I finished third at uh, uh, Canada uh, Grand Prix, and then uh, switched to, to IndyCar with uh, uh, McCormick. McCormick. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was very hard because uh, we didn't have a big budget. Mm-hmm. And uh, McCormick also got uh, all the old stuff from uh, uh, Ganassi, yeah, because oh. the, 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 the number was related to Ganassi for making money uh, through the, the teams. I, uh, you know, they, they give money for teams and, and things like that. So uh, it was, I was struggling there. Uh, then uh, I went to, with... Uh, Arciero and uh, um, uh, what's his name? Gee. He had a marine and he, he qualified me. Uh, he was with uh, Arciero. What's his name? Um, the the guy that like owned Arciero. Yeah, yeah. Frank? No, 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 not Frank Arciero. Oh, I was gonna say. Was yeah. great. Was uh, he he did it with uh, Raul Boisel. What's his name? Oh, Dick Simon? Dick Simon. Oh, yeah. 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 Then he worked for me afterwards. But uh, uh, on that year, uh, I raced for Dick Simon, and uh, it was good for Indianapolis. We did very well. At Long Beach, I was doing very well. I was uh, eighth with the Tel Fabi fighting for the race, you know, and, and uh, Goodyear. And then for Indy, uh, he gave me the old car. I said, why are you giving me the old car, Dick Simon? Oh, no, no, there's no problem. But the car wouldn't go well. So in the last day, 
of a qualifier, he said, okay, I asked Garcia, listen, the car is not doing well. I don't even know if I can do very well because I have no confidence. The car is strange. So he put the car and I was the only one who qualified on that day. I bumped Scott Goodyear and that was uh, great because I was the fastest of the day, blah, 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 blah. So I make more money than most people. I was going to say you get a little cash for that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, uh, and that was great. So it was a great, uh, unfortunately, the car broke down. So then uh, uh, we try other races, but it was struggling all the time. And, and uh, again, you know, it was very difficult. Uh, but it was fine. In the end of the day, I was racing and, and it was fine. Then in 95, I did a few races with uh, Gales. Uh, 96, I did uh, a race for Scandia. And uh, um, oh God. And then you went, to, you went to Foyt after that, right? Yes, yes. I did only Indy with Foyt. And it was good. It was a good experience because uh, uh, he could understand what uh, everybody could keep saying. Oh, he's very, very hard on the drivers yeah. and blah, blah, blah. He was so good with me. He was great. Friendly. Super, Super Texas is, uh, is an interesting guy. I mean, uh, you hear the stories about how hard he can be on people, but you also hear the other ones where he's, you know, very generous. I think it's guys who listen like, if you're willing to listen to him, I think those are the guys that he really likes to work with. Mm-hmm. And that's my impression I get from AJ. Yeah, yeah. And, and every time, I mean, I mean, I did it 228.84, so it was really fast. I mean, we, we did very well. Right. Uh, in an old car. In an old car. So, uh, unfortunately, in the race, the engine blew out and, and, uh, and uh, we couldn't finish. Then I, I raced this uh, IRL. Mm-hmm. 96, 97, I finished third in the championship. I could finish better. We had a big problem with uh, the Scandia guy, you know, uh, a few, uh, Andrew. Yeah? Right. Uh, uh, and uh, he was really difficult because we had a contract that was uh, for only two drivers. Then he kept putting people to, to make, uh, you know, the field. And, and I say, listen, uh, we have no engines. At that time, we had a lot of problems with engines. We have no engines. So he put me out of the practice. I couldn't practice or anything and keep putting other guys driving and blah, blah, blah. I say, I'm fourth in the championship. I needed to do well here. Why, mm-hmm. why are you doing that? No, no, because he has all the money. He thinks he is uh, the best guy and, and all this. So uh, then... Uh, at uh, Texas, the engine blow right after the, 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 the race starts because, uh, again, you know, he gave me all the old, old engines. So it was a big mess. I said, well, why are you doing that? We have a contract here. You're not fooling the, the contractor. Why are you doing this? Uh, no, no. He, he thinks he is the, the world, you know, the most important world man. <laughs> He's not because uh, I sue him and I won the 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 the, the judge say, Mister Evans, uh, you are a jet set man and you have your own plane and all this <laughs> and you think uh, Mister Greco have only uh, obligations. You are wrong. And uh, and then you know I knew then he was going to be in trouble because I was sure that uh, he was doing things wrong. Because he thinks they have the money, he could have all the engines. He couldn't have all the engines. He, there was no parts. There was nothing. You know? right. So, and then after that, uh, I went to Gales, and then we did a, a you know, in the second race, uh, pole position for one of the races. Uh, I was leading the race. Unfortunately, broke a small piece of uh, uh, where goes the the oil and and. Uh, I spin, but then we, I went to the pits, and they said, we cannot uh, continue. So then we went to Las Vegas. We have a problem with uh, uh, gas that uh, I think the where it goes. And like an O-ring or something? Like, N- no, you know, the, the 
when you make the corner, if the gas oh, goes... Oh, the pickup. Well, the, the yeah, the fuel pickup. Pick yeah. yeah, fuel pickup. So we had a problem. I went to the, the left uh, in the straights, but I was very slow. So I didn't want to go outside because it, this would be crazy. And uh, Guerrero came and it was a big accident. So he went upside down because he couldn't. Yeah. He, I think he didn't see me and he got me on the back. But anyway, I finished the race and uh, finished third uh, with uh, in the championship with uh, Eddie Cheever. And you were with three. You were with three different teams that year, right? So that's pretty incredible. You finished third in the championship, but you were with three different teams. Well, if the if uh, Scandia give me the the right thing, at least second place I would get that mm -hmm, at least right. because uh, you know the car breaking the first lap, right? And the engine blow in the first lap, and it's not only one time. So it was very very hard, but that was okay. Then I. I decided to to get my sponsor that I had and, and try to do my own team. I did that when I was nine years old in go-kart because uh, one guy promised to my dad, oh, I'm going to do the go-kart like my son and uh, he's going to win too. And uh, every time he used to break down, the wheel goes out, uh, fall out of the go-kart and things <laughs> like that, stupid things. I say, Daddy, let's go to the factory. We can buy the engine. What do you think? You know, and I have this uh, person who can help me here. It was a, a boy like uh, 15, 16 years old. He was, he understand a little bit of mechanics. And uh, I went there with my father uh, to the factory of the engines, put the engine, a new engine. I won all the races, and everybody used to open the engine and see if there was something <laughs> special. There was nothing, nothing. Just taking care of it properly, and you can do well. So that's what we did. And uh, so I decided to do that. I had a, a G-Force because of England, uh, they want me to do that, and because I finished third in the championship, so they want to do a deal with me, with the car, and help me out uh, with all this. And it uh, uh, was fine. I mean, uh, I didn't pay much for the, the chassis, and all the parts that was coming out comes to me too, first. So, then I decided to have a Roush. The Roush was a very expensive uh, engine. Mm -hmm. And even Ari Land, I said, I cannot understand Marco. Why I am the guy from Roush. All the parts, the new parts, come to me. How the heck are your engine doesn't break? I say, well, I tell you what. The owner of your team, they probably have an airplane. They use all the money in other stuff too, not only in the car. So maybe they live a little bit further, the engine, the mileage that many teams do that. And if you are lucky, you can do the race or you can practice more. But then in the end of the day, my friend, mileage is mileage, it's like an airplane. So when I am 400 miles, I send to Roush. So I don't pay much money because they just change some parts. But if you blow an engine, <laughs> it's a big, big money. So it's, that's, it's, that's it, starts, it starts ramping up real quick, the cost does. Exactly. So uh, we finished uh, 10th in the championship. Uh, was good because it was my first year as a team owner and a driver at the same time and not a mm -hmm. big budget. But, uh, right. and, and Dick Simon was working for me. Oh, oh wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, I didn't realize yeah. that either. Well, yeah, he was working for me. I was his driver in 94. But then in uh, uh, 98, he was working for me. And, uh, but he did something very bad for me. Oh. He did something very bad because uh, he say, I got uh, a sponsorship called Max Mill uh -huh. um, at Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. The guy came and uh, there was one guy from California who asked me to go to Indianapolis if he could help 
to change the tires and, and things like that. I said, well, you, you like it? Yes, I like it. I would like to go. So he went there. And uh, then after uh, the qualify, he said, I have a friend. He, he likes to talk to you. And uh, so can he talk to you? I said, yeah, of course. Bring him in. So we went to the, pit, to the garage. And he said, oh, how much cost that uh, on the back? Blah, blah, blah. So, well, 500,000. If you wanted to, to put in the car, it's 500. Wow, one moment. So he went outside <laughs> on the phone. He came back. Yes, I want to do it. I said, okay, you want to do it? Great. So we did Max Mill, blah, blah, blah. So then he said, I wanted to continue to do that. So he continued to the end. And then we signed out for three years of contract. Okay, five million per year. And uh, Dick Simon, uh, very, he was very disappointed at the last race in Las Vegas because I was pole position to the last minute of uh, the qualify. Then I, I went to, to third. And uh, that was okay too. So, but he said, well, that will be great for you in your career because... Uh, you did a very good qualify. But he was disappointed because he was trying to, and my lawyer there was there said, Marco, he's talking too much with the guy there. He's, you know, I don't know, be careful. Mm -hmm. What he did, one of the things he did, all, all the time when I go to the car, I put my feet under the floor, on the back, to see, you know, the right high is very important. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And was very high. And the car was very good on practice. And that was uh, 10 days after I had this big accident at uh, Texas. Uh, I was 40 minutes out. They took me to the helicopter. And then everybody said, what the fuck? I, you know, you just got a big accident and, and you were doing very well. Even uh, Floyd came to me, what you are doing to qualify like that? I said, <laughs> 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 Nothing, just the car is good. <laughs> because he used to trick it. <laughs> Everybody used to say, he, he did very well in the, in the qualifier, but then he go backwards right in the <laughs> beginning. <laughs> well, then the car in the race mm -hmm. was undrivable. Undrivable. Even on the straight, the car was, you know, very sensitive. And I keep calling on the radio. Oh, we're going to change it. But the car never was the same but we finished i think uh, eighth or seven i don't know but i was disappointed because uh, i feel that but then i didn't even realize he called me one day because he, we live in california i used to live in california and he you too and he say marco i have to talk to you and i say okay let's go let's have a lunch so well uh i'm gonna do my own team again and uh if you want to come you have to bring sponsorship. I say, well, I have a sponsorship. And why are you you going to go away? No, 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 no. Uh, I say, Who is your sponsorship? Oh, it's Max Mill. I say, no, he signed with me. No, 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 no. I say, well, uh, Dick Simon, I don't want to fight with you. You know, if I am right, I have great lawyers <laughs> who take <laughs> care of business. <laughs> and if we are right, I learn here in the United States, at least when I went to, you know, confront with uh, Evans, even with his 10 lawyers that he had there, I have one lawyer. This one lawyer uh, by Forbes, he was one of the 10 best lawyers in Southern California who is less than 40 years old. And he was very, you know, he was a lawyer from uh, Dennis Rodman. My manager used to oh. manage Dennis Rodman and many other athletes and and uh, he said marco he's the best you, you, you can have so i said uh, dick you're gonna have a problem <laughs> i want to continue with my team we have everything so that's why he bought what he did is he still all my information about the car okay all year he used everything he copied everything and then he bought 
a G-force, I don't know if you know, but it was a G-force and everything the same mm -hmm. as me. But he didn't, they didn't have a result. He was struggling all the time, even with Guerrero for the Indy 500. And, and, and they keep going. Then comes the day that uh, you have to confront, and, and then he lost. He lost the lawsuit again. Because, I mean, this is ridiculous. Why the guy steal you like that? I mean, this is stupid. But then his driver, who is a friend of mine, the French driver, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, yeah, I know you're talking nice, about Very nice, very nice guy. Very yeah. nice. He sued Dick Simon. <laughs> he sued Dick Simon. Dick Simon had to pay him to. I don't know why, but I know that. But then, uh, you know, he had to pay me. And uh, Was it Gregoire? That. Was it Stefan Gregoire? It's Stefan Gregoire. He's very yeah. nice, uh, nice person. Yeah. Yeah. Fast. Very nice. And, um, I mean, this is bad. And, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons I say, well, then I have my daughter that was born there in 97. And I say, well, I think, uh, you know, that will be it and that's the reason basically i stopped it because i didn't feel more you know comfortable with all these uh, problems that was going on uh, but i know one thing you know the the, the law at least uh, with me doesn't matter if you're black white green yellow doesn't matter if you are right you have the right position you are honest you're you're never gonna lose, never. You um, uh, you 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 were talking. To, uh, how old were you at this time? I mean, because you were still really young at that time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were. I, I, I'm 57 now. So you were. I mean, I'm trying to do the math there. So you were. It's basically 21 years ago. So you're 37, 36? late 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, I mean that's uh, that's a lot of stuff to go through by the time you're 36. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, you know, broker the 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 thing that I was supposed to, I think was going to be good, you know, right? Mm -hmm. Three years of contract with uh, a big company like that, and he used all the money. Dick Simon used all the money. I mean, having no results at all on that years, I think it was two or three years he did, no results at all. And and uh, unfortunate because for me he was a nice person. Otherwise, I would never would invite him to come to my team. And we always uh, we talk the same language also to set up the car. He understand when I'm saying to to him, "Oh, this is what's going on here. This corner under steer, over steer." I think then I I know the setups of the car, how to do it, and he he used to do what I want. And the car was good. So there was a, a, a situation that uh, honesty doesn't exist there. Yeah, that's too bad, too. I, and I mean, and unfortunately, auto racing is just full of stories like this. I mean, it's, um, you know, and I'm sure there's two sides to every story, but you just, you hear there's so much of this. Um, yeah, but then he's done. I mean, he never yeah, sure. was able to do any more because right. he was doing very bad with other people. Right. Not only right. with Marco. I mean, with me, he got the money to, to, to race, but then he had to pay me. Right. But he screwed me. So. Right. And the same with Evans. But I don't know. I mean, this is something that uh, didn't supposed to happen on this type of, on this level of racing. Well, that, and that's the thing, you know, Andy Evans, I believe, he made his money in Microsoft, right? Isn't that where I think he oh, was? We know all the story of him <laughs> because we, when we move a lawsuit against him, we, we knew everything that he got in jail because uh, 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 Microsoft to, to protect, you know, the owner of Microsoft. Him and his wife went to jail, spent time there. Oh, he's a white collar. But fuck, it's bad. <laughs> right. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's bad. They, st they still have bars at lock at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and you take go to jail for, for somebody else, that must be 
be very a lot of money involved in it to do yeah. that. Yeah, I remember he was like a drunken sailor with those race cars. I mean, at one time, didn't he? Did he have seven or eight at the speedway? It was some ridiculous number he had at one time. It, yeah, you know, yeah, he, you know, it was just like he couldn't get enough of them. Yeah, I remember that. But in like the like a lot of those deals, but you do that, but then there's nothing there. You mm-hmm. got a lot of race cars, and you got nothing good. You know, you mm-hmm. got. You know, use parts, use motors, whatever you're doing. You know, oh, it's terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. I used to, I go out, say, "Oh my God, this is <laughs> terrible." Oh no, you don't know how to drive. Right, you're, you're breaking the gears. I say, "How the heck I can break the gears?" <laughs> right, you know, all this stuff. No dog rings. The dog rings was completely done, and you right. put in the car for me to just give a few laps, slow. I mean, I'm I'm him to here to race, not to, to just to go around. Maybe there are people who, who who would like to be that, but I always have a feeling that I can be competitive. I cannot, maybe not the best in the world, but I can be competitive. I show right. that when I got the you know the Gallus racing, I was the fastest at the, one of the races, and not because someone stopped. In the pits, and I got the you know leading the race. No, right. it's because. Uh, and also, I'm going to tell you something that uh, I never told anybody. I was very surprised because uh, you know the organization there, not the the owner from from Indianapolis, okay. But uh, after I qualify at uh, the racetrack and I make the pole position. In, at Loudoun, uh, they call me on their bus, okay, on the bus, and I say, well, they're going to compliment me because uh, you know, <laughs> right. I did well, and da da da. And no, they call me there to say, listen, uh, congratulations, but uh, we want uh, uh, to ask you. Uh, to do something that will be very important. So, yeah, well, what? Well, we want you to let uh, Scott Goodyear go ahead of you uh, in the race. I said, what? I'm here to work. You're wrong. You're completely wrong. You guys, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. This is a race. There are more than 20 people working at the Gala's Racing for me to do well. And you are asking me to, Scott Goodyear... And I say, tell him to go faster because uh, he's not <laughs> going to go ahead of me in the first corner because I'm going to go ahead. And I mean, I was passing everybody like a, there were, the, the racetrack was mine. It's, it was unbelievable. I mean, when I look at the race, I say, wow, everybody goes outside and I go inside like a normal uh, racing. And my car was ticking there <laughs> very well. So I try. Uh, what? Uh, why? Why do you think that they did that? I mean, what was, yeah. what was they trying to gain now that? I don't know. I don't know. But there was. They were very pissed when I asked. Uh, when I answered them that. They were, was it? Was he driving the Panther car at that time? Was he driving that Pinzol car? Um. I don't. I don't remember my time. Wait, no, not Pinzol car. No. 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 Pinzol okay. car was. Uh, I believe it was Guerrero. No, yeah, Guerrero, I believe. Oh, that's right. Guerrero had it for a while. That's right, and I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. But, and what? Uh, and what year? What year is this? Nineteen ninety-seven at Loud. Okay. If you want, I show. I send you. No, the, I just. I was just trying to figure out maybe if it was a sponsor. Because I was trying like, to figure out the sponsor thing or what. Because that just, I don't even get that. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, it's really strange. Very strange. Very, I mean, coming from organization. Sure. This is a crime. <laughs> well, yeah. No, that's, that's... This is a fraud. It's unbelievable. It's even, strange. it's even stranger that he, you know, because it was like a, a push. But originally... wasn't him. Wasn't him. No, right, right, right. Yeah. What was the organization who called me there. We want to talk to you. And and you have to do this. Oh, yeah. and because I say, well, why? Because he have more experience. I say, 
I don't care how you have experience. Right. My name is Marco Greco. I, I'm pole position, and I'm going to go for the race. I want to win the race. Sure. Yeah, I I agree. I, it's even such a strange thing because, cause, you know, the IRL was started for, uh, you know, in theory for young American uh, short, circle track racers. That was kind of the thing. But Scott Goodyear was Canadian, and he yeah, wasn't Canadian. that young. You know, so that, that's just so weird. I mean, I'm glad yeah. you shared that. I'm glad you shared that story yeah, with us because that I would have never ever guess that. Yeah, I it has it has to be so frustrating. I mean, I, yeah. like here, here it is. You're working so hard, and then now the people you think are going to be in your corner, and you're going to be able to work with them and maybe help promote, mm-hmm. uh, you know, amongst maybe the Brazilians and, and get new fans and all that. And they're trying to tell you, hey man, why don't you slow that down just a little bit? That that has to be frustrating. I yeah. man. It makes you oh. wonder how many more stories there are like that well, out there that you just don't know. But right. I never, never thought of some something like that would happen. And I know, yeah. I know, uh, I heard stories on boxing, and you know, but it's right. a different thing. It's very different, and it, it's a very different class of people too that are involved on this type of uh, uh, sport. So I, I was very surprised. But Tony Georgia wasn't there. Right. It was only, uh, I forgot his name. Yeah, I don't remember who the race director and all that was in. I, I don't. But there was, there was one guy, he's very, he was very old and very well with uh, the organization. Uh, he was also in the uh, prices, you know, in the end of the year. He, he was all the time there. 97, 96, uh, and they was very upset with me after, very upset. But, you know, what can I do? I, I, I'm not going to give up what I did. I mean, sure. I worked so hard for yeah. to, to oh, start yeah. something, you know. Oh, yeah, I don't blame you. I wouldn't. I would uh... <laughs> I would have <laughs> <But I'm laughs> reacted the same way. I never published that because I think it was going to be a big scandal for you know sure. someone off organization call you you know and, and do that uh, uh you know can you do me that favor fuck you right <laughs> no, i i just said the same thing you know you were you talked about sin a while ago mm-hmm. and uh you know i've heard Kanan talk you know just in interviews talk about you know, the things that Senna did for him. It sounds like, you know, that Senna really tried to reach out to the young Brazilians and and try to, you know, help guys. Is, is that accurate or no? I mean, like with no. advice or... No, or, he, he, he has uh, some people that he likes a lot. He liked me when I raced a motorcycle. Yeah. After right. that, when I started racing cars... I was more with, friendly with the Mauricio Sala, that also was a, a great uh, driver. Mm-hmm. And uh, I written, I, I speak with him sometimes. Sometimes he called me in England, in my house, when I used to live there, because our uh, guy who prepared ourselves uh, as a, a physical uh, physiologist, he was sometimes in my house, he spent a month there in my house, and so he, Ayrton called me, hey, you two are not doing anything, just sleeping, come on, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than that, I mean, uh, I was surprised one time uh, when uh, I, I was in Monza for the FIA uh, testing at, in Formula One. And uh, uh, Bernie Eccleston came to me, Marco, you don't have the super license yet. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through all these names that I give to you now here, and they're just going to sign saying, okay, that's for you, for you to, to, to drive with them, with the car. And uh, so you go through, please. And I say, okay. So I went to Nigel Man. So, oh, great, you're going to race. Because on that year, I was racing for him in, in Formula 3000. Oh, okay. oh fantastic, Marco. Uh, uh, Nelson Piquet, I never met him before. And, oh, coming to my bus here. He was so nice to me. 
and uh, was different uh, vision from other people, other drivers from Nelson Piquet. But there was a reason for why he, he was uh, kind of uh, difficult, uh, especially on interview. Uh, and uh, I said, well, Ayrton, I'll, I leave it for the, the, the last because, uh, you know, he's going to sign and there'll be no problem. So I arrived there and uh, I said, well, I, everybody signed here already for me to test with, the, with you guys. And uh, uh, I just need your signature here. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to sign. So, huh? Well, your car's too slow, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I race here in Formula 3000 in Monza. I race motorcycle here in Monza. So, uh, you know, 500cc, we, we go very fast here, uh, probably as fast as you guys here, more than 300 kilometers an hour. So, well, let me think a little bit about, and you come back later, okay? Say, okay. And then I arrived there, he was fighting with his father, blah, 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 blah just arguing. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> but then he said, okay, I'm going to sign, but please look in the mirror. I said, well, of course I'm going to look in the mirror. I cannot even drive with the cars like you guys. You guys have a completely different car. So I was surprised for that because he was always, you know, I know him since I was nine years old. Our... Uh, tuning engine was the same guy so many times I went to his Mercedes he was very rich already because his father is an industrial uh, related industrial business and uh, we go to the, his Mercedes into the kart uh, racing kartodromo huh? and uh, then you know all the, the friendship in go-kart and then in motorcycle when I you know race and talk to him and blah, 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 interview with him together. So it was always fine. I don't think he, he helped a lot of people in racing. He helped a lot of people uh, that need school, you know. Mm -hmm. He did right. that. Okay. He, was very, he was very nice with that. Very, very nice. But uh, other than that, he helped uh, uh, Barrichello in the sense of uh, enthusiastic, blah, blah, blah. I test uh, one bike that he, he bring to Brazil. It, it was a Ducati with his name is Senna. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. to, just to make him uh, good that the one rider drove his bike and approve it. But there was nothing special. It was a Ducati with some parts in carbon. You know, right. And for him to make more money. <laughs> 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 I saw one of those recently. Uh, I, somebody either had it for sale or something. I don't, I just saw. I don't even remember where I saw that, but I saw one of those just recently. Mm -hmm. um, so you've come to America and you've raced, and now you're kind of coming to the end. What? Uh, where did you? What did you? Did you already have a business by then? You obviously pretty smart business guy. I mean, to make it all work and put these <laughs> deals together. Um, it was very of, hard. Oh, it's so well, difficult. When I, when I start racing a uh, motorcycle, uh, I didn't have much money in the, in when I went to to Europe. So I used it to to drive the truck with the mechanic, sleep in the truck, have a shower in the petrol station. It was very hard. But then I start to making my money, and and uh, I did very well. I always uh, look for. A big piece, not small piece, you know, for any kind of business that I'm gonna do. Today, I I I deal with art. You're gonna say what? Art? Yes, art. I don't. I know noticed how. some art. I noticed some yeah, art when you first come on. I, that was the first thing I noticed was your art. <laughs> yeah. So what I do? I mean, I. What I can explain is when I was 14 years old. Uh, I, w I went to school, and it was a German school here in Brazil, okay? And uh, there was a, a beautiful girl. I said, <laughs> wow, this is beautiful. She's so beautiful. And there's three sisters. I said, well, she's so beautiful. How the heck am I going to get into this girl? Because she's so nice, I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so then I learned that uh, uh, her father is Germany, and uh, Jewish, 
Jewish love art, Jewish people. So I say, well, then I have to learn about art. <laughs> so every day, seven o'clock in the night, there was a program in the TV on TV that uh, talk about art, the Brazilian art, the artists, and blah blah blah. Then uh, you know, after a while, I, I start to talk to her. Blah, blah blah. Then we we she was my girlfriend for nine years, and we went to a lot of museums, and and you know, I I, I don't know why, but. I am very successful with the, the art business. Uh, I mean, I can, I can go and, and an auction and, and I learn, of course, I study and, and I see what is good and what is not good. Then when I arrive here, I say, okay, who are the best Martians in Brazil? Marsh, you know what's Martian, yeah? Sure. Martians sure. are the guys who look after art. And uh, oh, there are three guys here, so I bought one piece of each one who are selling then I make a friendship with them so I have a behind me someone who can help me if I have a doubt about uh, you know this art is good or this piece is good or not good because there is a lot of uh, mm -hmm. false uh, stuff you know and um, right. I, I am the one who likes to fish in the bowl okay so it's easy and I, I know <laughs> what's <in> there <laughs> <laughs> you um yeah, and art, like you said, I mean, I could never do it because, you know, it doesn't all look the same to me. You can always spot a great piece, right? But you don't, you got to have, I mean, somebody has to have a real eye to really sort them out and, and spot, you know, an average what piece is good from something else. Yeah. I can go in many gallery and uh, sometimes I see pieces that uh, I can see for 12 years going around and never sell and i am very uh, lucky i don't know why but i buy something and when i decided to sell it because they are very expensive mm -hmm. someone buy it right and 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 it's a big uh, difference from what i pay at a margin I, I, yeah good margin yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, 300 percent i mean it's it's unbelievable and uh sometimes in auction i fight with uh, uh bankers okay there are bankers that uh, want to buy the piece but the, the my analysis is they are very uh reason they go by the reason okay this piece doesn't work more than you know i cannot pay more than this and then they stop. They go, 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 go. Then they stop. And I break a little bit late. <laughs> <laughs> Just driving in about 20 feet yeah. further. <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, after six, seven months, he buy me for two times more than what I pay. That's amazing. And that's awesome. And I, and yeah. I, I, love, I love stories like that. I, I do. It's, I mean, I've been very lucky. I mean, it's... Uh, so what those bankers don't understand is, is you've been in auto racing where nothing makes sense. So, you know, they don't understand what they're dealing with. Exactly. Exactly. And when I started to buy, I mean, there was a, a bunch of people, a bunch of Martians in my door. Oh, I have a piece for you, blah, blah, blah. And, and they thought that I was only a collector. Mm -hmm. right. So they did the good prices for me. But then when they see that I was selling it, Fuck this guy! Is, <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, I they guess, probably stopped showing up. They probably stopped showing up then. <laughs> well, yeah, and and you know that that's the way it is. I was very lucky. I'm happy with that too. And I think uh, I did uh, uh, what I like to do in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I see Wayne Rainey one example. I mean, he, he, one time he told me that uh, after his accident, uh, he said, Marco, mm -hmm. I wish I, I was uh, working at the McDonald's than racing because with all this money that I have here, I cannot play with my children, that my, my child that have two years old, that is two years old. So I've been in, into crashes with the motorcycle, broke bones, and, and also big accident at Texas uh, with, with the IndyCar. Uh, even on the street when I was a young boy, you know, 
uh, racing in, in the street. I mean, this, this was crazy, very crazy. And uh, I still here, so I'm very lucky because I, I, I still can do whatever I want without any deficiency on, on my body. And that I thank God for, for all this. And, you know, I have a great family. I have two, two I have my daughter that was born in 97. She, she's American. And my son also, Thomas, he's American. They never think about race. I mean, I have a, more than 100 trophies there, here in my house in, in the thing. They never look there, what is this or that? I like to race. No. My daughter, she, she finished, uh, she graduated at uh, the university in, in California. And the four years of uh, study there, she did the psychology. She did in two years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And now she's doing the post-graduation to clinic, to clinic uh, after. And Thomas enter also in the california but we are doing it online because it wasn't open yet All right and uh he's doing that he wants to be a senator i say you're crazy <laughs> a senator in the united states i say oh my god yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he, he is doing you know good classes for business and for uh, science uh, uh and, and he wants to do that, and he was very nice. I mean, he plays the violin in the school here, American school. Plays the violin. He, on Saturday, instead of uh, came home and go with friends out, he say, no, I'm going to give uh, uh, classes for the children that uh, work in the... Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, stay, you know, very poor people. So he, he do classes for them at the, the, the school itself, yeah? Not uh, outside yeah. the school. So he was the chief of, uh, uh, you know, the leader of uh, the, the children that, uh, and he did that for many years since he was very young. So he is very different in in in, uh, in the approach of things, and and uh, he's nice. Don't like uh, fight. I say, oh, you have to fight. I mean, I was uh, I did the kung fu for many years. Mm -hmm. I was trained by the command of uh, army from Israel, and so I like all this, the sports and, and fighting and things like that. And he said, no, fight is no good. So it's a different uh, type of, uh, I believe people are getting more out of this kind of uh, uh, thinking of uh, uh, fighting, and, and so he don't like it. So he's very nice, very sweet, and very intelligent. Very intelligent. Not like the father. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess kind of wrapping up. So so what was it like? So obviously, so what was racing in the Indy 500, was that ever like on, on your mind like before you came over to America? Or were no. you always just like F1? Was F1 always kind of your... F1, and I was always think my god look at these guys the accidents they show us like you know guys with legs out and things like oh, that. oh yeah oh no 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 this is crazy and emerson used to say that too but then in the end the, when i arrived the first time at the indianapolis i went out from from the garage and then i went to the track I said, what the heck? how can you the guys drive a car almost 400 kilometers an hour and it's so small you know from one side to the other i say it would be impossible for me mm -hmm. <laughs> but then in the end uh, you know uh, you just uh, go through and it's uh, you use it i use the sports psychology mm -hmm. okay i uh, uh, actually one of the guys who helped me in uh, 97 was uh, Anthony Robbins. He went to the, in, in, he called me in the middle of the night. Hey, <laughs> it's me. I said, what, uh, who are you? <laughs> 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 it's me, Tony Robbins. I said, Tony Robbins, 
Come on. No, you listen to me. I'm going to have my plane and I'm going to go tomorrow to you and I'm going to see you at the racetrack because I had a, a, a connection in California. Mm -hmm. and, and then I say, oh, I, I would like to, to see Anthony Robbins one day, talk to him because I have his tapes since 1991 in England. Oh, okay. I bought it and, uh -huh. and I like it. Ah, okay. So then suddenly, he, and he went there to India. I mean, I saw your picture. You put. I saw you had a picture with him. I was going to ask how how uh, how you knew him because I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. He he's good. He. I mean, he. In few hours, mm -hmm. I mean, he explained me a lot of things. Of course, I do that uh, type of uh, uh, visualization and all this since uh, eighty four when I raced motorcycle. And it, it is very important. Now, many people are still maybe not doing it, this type of thing. But the visualization is very important because the brain doesn't know the reality from the fantasy. The, 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 the brain doesn't know how to do that. Plus, I studied with, uh, at the University of Athens in Ohio with one of the greatest uh, physiologists in the world, uh, Professor Friedrich Hagerman. Uh, he died uh, a few years ago, but he he was an uh, Olympic champion with the raw uh, guys. And in 1992, he was doing program for NASA for the astronauts that was going to Mars. So he was very smart. He had, I think, four or five books. And I spent the time at his house, uh, you know, learning a lot of things and doing a lot of testing physiological testing so and at Indianapolis I learned that uh, I needed to use something for that because I was going around and I say oh, now I'm flat out and I push very very hard in the throttle you know doing really to, to be flat out mm -hmm. so I stop in the pits I say now I was flat out but uh, the, the speed doesn't come and then they put the computer in front of me and say no Marco we were lifting 60%. I said, what the hell? 60%? Oh, wow. Not possible. Yes, yes, it's possible. I said, okay. Then I learned that uh, putting the throttle a little bit, you do one lap. And when you push the throttle a little bit, you have to think, this is the full throttle. And then you go. And then the other lap, you put a little bit more. And then more. And then suddenly, you are flat out. But that is the problem. The brain wants, to, oh, 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 this is too much. No, 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 no. Then you, you know, automatically lift even when you don't want to. It's unbelievable. So the brain, it's very important how to work with your brain on this type of things, this situation. Well, the brain's trying to save your life. Yes. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what it's trying to do. You know, I, I've said before, um, I come from more of a dirt racing background. I did not race myself, but a family member did that. And like I've said before, so many of the things you have to do in certain situations are counterintuitive to what your brain wants you to do. You know, your brain's wanting you to lift and, and slow it down and gather it up. When in, in turn, the safest thing is to just get it hard, as hard as a throttle as you can, get the wheels turning and get the car out of trouble. But, yeah. you know, it, it's, uh, I, I can believe that. I mean, you know, that's, uh, man, the human brain, it, it's trying to save the human body at all yes. times. Yes, you know? yes, exactly, exactly. You sweat because the, the body needs to take all this out. Otherwise, you can blow, I mean, your, uh, your blood pressure, are going up already and if you don't sweat anything it's a big problem it is a big problem also before the race you look many many drivers go like 200 without even doing anything mm -hmm. if you do the visualization before i mean you, there are techniques for that if you do that i mean your heart gonna pump much more slower Okay, it'll be like uh, 
hundred or ninety five is already pumped out, but because you did the visualization before, it's like this happened already, and you're just redoing it. Right. What happened is your heart, if it pumps too fast, doesn't have a time to fill with blood to send it to your brain. Mm -hmm. And that is the problem. You see many mistakes happening when you are tired because your heart is pumping too hard and is not receiving too much blood and oxygen in, in your brain. So the function is uh, very important to, to do that uh, type of things. Plus, of course, the running, you know, cardiovascular is very important. Oh yeah, absolutely. So one thing I've always been intrigued about is when you look at like all the um, all the big motorcycle guys have gone over to car racing. Like almost every single one of them are like extremely successful. And I, w I always had a thought that it seems like, and obviously you'll be able to kind of answer this better, but it always seems to me that like motorcycle racing kind of prepares you more for driving a car than actually like driving a car does. I think different than that. Really? I think very different. Yeah, when you see how I mean, as I, as I say in the beginning, how many riders, world champion, mm -hmm. have been successful, really successful in racing cars, going to all the steps and go to Formula One or, or Indy cars. You don't see too many. Drive is one thing. Be very fast and right. precise. It's very different. Is very different, so I think different. Uh, as I say, I mean the, the this acceleration on the bike is too great, close to the cars. I mean you have to almost stop the bike, comparing with the cars, and, and that is the problem. Many 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 riders cannot uh, understand. But I one example. I came from a go kart, so my brain was already knew a little bit about it mm -hmm. and even now, though I mean, it's not the same <laughs> now you were talking about uh getting your brain to do something now i gotta imagine the first few times you're going through the corners in a bike and you're really hauling and, and you're, you're scraping getting, your knee and you <laughs> and you got your knee and everything right on the ground now i would think that you got to talk yourself into that a little bit too i used to come when i was uh 12 years old I come with my, my pants with a big hole because I used to do that uh, uh, in the... Uh, there was a park that many people used to go with the bikes there and it's like a zero. And I used to go there and all oh, my, my... My mom was crazy. Stop <laughs> to make holes in your pants! Right in your knee! Uh, you know, this wasn't uh, a problem. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd already trained that brain for that. You, you no, had to on that time, yeah. on, I didn't yeah. know anything about the brain sure. doing that. I just wanted no, to I do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, you know, Aaron always likes to ask a question um, to guys who've run an indie. Uh, Aaron, you, you like to ask uh, what indie means to yeah, you. Yeah, and, it, and it's an open, and you know, it's an open question. You can kind of perceive it however you want. But basically, like Scott said, what, what you know, what did running indie really mean to you? I mean, obviously... You said it was never really kind of on your mind to race it. So when you went over there, I'm sure it was kind of, um, it probably kind of surprised you how big of a deal it was, right? No, I knew it was big because you can see on the on the tapes, on the right, movies, sure. that a lot of people was there. Uh, everybody, I mean, uh, go, the schools go there. When I, when I went there, the schools go there. They throw you the, you know, the books to for you to sign and then they come bring it back in the cord so uh, i know that uh, uh, was great i feel great there all the time that i went there i was very happy you know uh into it and the people knew you you go to eat something in the restaurant ah yeah. oh, marco <laughs> not because oh, yeah. i am the best but they know everything about you already even if you, from the first to the last you know is it is a little bit different than in brazil in brazil if you're if you if you are the champion you're okay 
<laughs> if you're second, nah, they don't care. Well, yeah. I feel like I feel like in countries um, like Brazil, like you said, if you're the champion, like they feel represented, they want to get behind oh, yeah. the winner. Uh, we're in America. Everybody that, is they, uh, respected, and yeah, and and, uh, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. And it's just a, it's at least it uh, it feels to me that in America. We like a really good underdog story. Like we like champions too, but oh. we really we really enjoy like the underdog. So I think that's like what you said. Like, you know, you have so many fans. Um, they'll man, Marco Greco's driving for AJ. So I love AJ. You know, I kind of like Marco. You know, I've been watching him, and so now you know you're a fan favorite to a certain group there. And you know, like you say, it just goes on down the line. Every year it's you know, just different people. And I, I think that is really um, something, I, I wouldn't say it's unique to America, but it's something I find that I, I really enjoy about, especially the 500 itself, but just racing in general in America. No, I, I, I like uh, uh, American people. I like, uh, I don't know if it's everywhere, because I've been around all over the world. So in Italy... But when they know you are uh, into the sport and they like it, ah, oh, they they get crazy. I mean, in Italy, I arrived there and and uh, the, you know, in a little place there close to to Imola, and uh, there was a big table with a lot of guys there drinking wine and and then oh, I heard and. This place have like a small place for sleeping, and that's why I was. I heard that uh, you you race. You want to sit down with us here? I said oh, okay. So I sit down mm -hmm. there with them, <laughs> and we start talking. And the guy, well, uh, I have uh, the bike from my my brother, and he would love if you can go out and give uh, a lap around with uh, the bike here on the street. He would love it. The bike, I'm sure, was his bike. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, okay, so everybody was outside. So I wait out there in the, in the little road and come back. And suddenly I, I took my, my hand from the handlebar. And it was only one, one hand doing that long corner coming. Oh, when I stopped, how you did that? Oh, my <laughs> God, you have one hand only doing that corner. I say, well, that's fine. So they get really crazy. And then, oh. Our uh, rider is Marco Lucinelli. No, the others say, no, 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 it's not Marco Lucinelli, it's Marco Greco. We know <laughs> Marco Greco, so they get crazy about it. So, so it's different. In Brazil, uh, when I race bikes, I mean, I win many, many races here. So I was very famous here for, the, for racing bikes. Uh, when you go to different things, they, and, you know, they just... They are not the same, you know. If you if you race uh, well, then oh, you're fantastic. But if you don't race well, and in, in England the same thing, you know. I wasn't doing very well in Formula Three, and then suddenly, oh, four fastest, uh, <laughs> you know, finished six. Then you know, oh, you're doing very well. So, and uh, Thomas Danielson was uh, one of my teammate and friend, and he told me, Marco. You see, one day you are shit, and the other <laughs> day you are a star. So this world is very crazy. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, that's life. So, but I'm I'm happy, you know, with everything and uh, the family and uh, what I did and meet yeah. other people like you and Aaron. And I mean, it's it's uh, great. I mean that. Uh, he entered in contact with me, and, and uh, I was very happy, uh, you know, see people that uh, without any uh, need, really, comes to you and talk to you. You don't see any interest in, in, in you know, in other things, and, and that's great. I mean, that makes my spirit happy. Well, we're glad. You know, we, that one thing when Aaron and I started this, um, we wanted to give 
just racers. I mean, when I say racers, could be anybody in the sport, a chance to tell their story. And, uh, man, you've, you've shared yeah. a really great story with us today, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and uh, everything that I say is true. I mean, I could. Some people don't tell everything. They just get yeah. to, you know. Oh no, I did. No, you know, I'm normal. <laughs> Life is like that. We are open to to everybody. Right. Many people wants to to know things, and when they know, they they are happy and they have more. More uh, oh, knowledge, yeah. knowledge, right? Well, kind of a last question. Um, one thing that I like to do, um, this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this, is uh, I have a question where I ask uh, the person that we have on as a guest, and it could be anybody, I mean, it could be a family member, it could be just maybe somebody worked at a go kart shop or a track. To give you a chance to talk about somebody else in your life that may have influenced you in racing or to be a part of racing, it can be a competitor. I mean, it can literally be anybody. Um, just somebody that maybe we haven't discussed or somebody we may have discussed a little bit and you'd like to expand on. Hmm. No, uh, I know Emerson Fittipaldi since I was uh, nine years old. And uh, he, he gave me the trophy for the national championship in go-kart. Yeah. Uh, I met him there. Many people on that time thought that, uh, and, and that time he was, uh, I think he was 72 or something like that. And he, uh, everybody from the press thought, Marco going to be the next Fittipaldi. Because... <laughs> Yeah, I was very right. good. I was very good with my own thing, doing my own thing, because, uh, uh, you know, wasn't good with the, the team that have uh, somebody influence, not good for me, okay? Because he was protecting his son, and, and uh, he won races, and, and I was <coughs> behind. Right. And I learned that, you see, afterwards, many, many years afterwards, I knew that, right? And, and you know, it's very clear. If uh, you don't have the people behind you, you're gonna be in trouble. And you even think that is yourself who to blame, because I always been very um, incisive in in uh, how can I get Marco better, or if I did any mistake, I am responsible for it. So, and sometimes it's very hard because I complain by myself. I say, oh, I don't think I can do it. But the reason sometimes are covered by other things that you don't even think about. And I'm lucky that uh, Eddie Jordan gave me this chance to, mm -hmm. to drive his car. And I say, what the heck? How can I do that? <laughs> I, I right. did not, nothing different. I say, I didn't. And... Uh, Eddie Jordan arrived to me, Marco, how the heck you did this all year and no results at all, not even qualify. And now you, you did one-tenth of uh, the, the, the pole position here from Guillaume. So, and I'm sure many, many drivers and riders have uh, these problems and they don't even understand why they, they think they are the ones who are doing nothing. <laughs> right. And, and uh, who, who, for me, the one who really uh, make me race was myself when I was seven years old because I, I didn't know anything about this. And, and then I decided, I say, wow, this is what I want to do in my life. <laughs> Just because I see a go-kart going on the top of a, a car, and I, I didn't even know what it was it. <laughs> and after that, I started to want to do something. Actually, we had a, my father bought a go-kart for us, for me and my brother. And he used it to my older brother. Okay? He used to try to, to do the same. 
okay, drive the same as me, mm -hmm. but he, he crashed the go-kart, and, uh, and then he had a big accident. We go to a place that was round, and there was a lot of cars there parking, but, uh, you know, it was free that place to, to, for, me to, for us to drive. I say, I went in the go-kart, then I say, well, listen, Vicente, my, my brother, uh, it's very slippery, there is a lot of sand in there, so be careful. Oh, no, no, don't worry. And, and then in the end, uh, he slide down. Fortunately, he didn't went to, on the bottom of the car that was parking there. But he broke uh, you know, the ribs, uh, got the, uh, he lost his completely the mind for one day, and it was very... Very scary, you know, for young. He was 10 years old. And my father said, we, I don't want that anymore. I don't, you know, this, no good. He gave the go-kart to the, the factory. And, uh, and then I, this I kept in my mind. Ah, I like it. I, I think I like it. Then I insist and I insist. And my father gave me this uh, type of go-kart, you know, the formula with the, mm -hmm. but the engine was great. This 175 cc. <laughs> was oh, yeah. yeah so and then the ones who in, i really decided to do the motorcycle was my my cousin that uh, he was great but the problem is uh i like to do what he did you know he did a lot of things different uh like uh he showed to the people and everybody hey go 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 on the street on the racetrack he was unbelievable but on the street, he was completely out of the normal on the 70s, okay? Uh, a, a great control on the bike. He slide, he said, no, when you do this on the bike, you know, you, uh, I don't know in English, but uh, you, you just lock your rear wheel and go like this, okay? Right. Say, this, is, this is good, but the best is you throw the bike on the floor you come fast very fast mm -hmm. and you break the rear wheel and throw the bike on the floor and then goes to all the fire from the uh, cavalete i don't know in english now so uh, but it was crazy you know and everybody ah! and i was doing that but it's very hard to do that because you have to have a lot of confidence to do that because you, it's very fast and you can hurt yourself so i like to do that but then I realized that uh, after his death, and, 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 and I, I also almost died on that uh, year. Two months before, I got the car from my father, and uh, I was like 140 kilometers an hour on the street, going fast, and I got a big uh, concrete uh, pole, because I, I, there was three lines, I went to, on the left, on the corner, it was a very fast corner, almost straight, but there was a, one car, so I went to the middle, there was another car, then I went, was going to the right, the other car in the middle went to the right, so I, I say, imagine, with 13 years old, I say, I'm going to pass him through the uh, sidewalk, as soon as I went to the sidewalk, broke the suspension. Oh, sure. At that speed. And I got this pole without breaking. So I broke uh, my leg, uh, uh, knee. I mean, it was terrible. N uh, my nose. Thank God I didn't broke any teeth in the front. But it was, you know, I was for 15 days in the hospital. They couldn't operate me because on that time they didn't have the tomography or anything that could show because everything was closed my eyes were closed and uh, so they have to wait for one one week no 10 days for make the surgery on, on my leg and put a pin a big pin on my leg because they didn't know if it happened something on the brain so it was a uh, and then i went home and three days after he died on the street after one year without racing because of another accident that he had. 
And uh, so, you know, things crazy like that. And uh, so I say, no, uh, this is no good. No glory on dying like this. This is stupid. I mm -hmm. want to be a champion. That was my lucky situation. It was a, it's a, it's a experience that uh, it's sad, but it's important for you to realize. Some people don't realize, and, they, and then they end up uh, doing stupid things, continue to do and die. You know, but then I was lucky to understand that uh, racing is only at the racetrack. You cannot do racing on the street, putting on. Thank God I didn't got anybody and they didn't kill anybody on the right. sidewalk. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and like you said, when you're that young, you just don't even realize. You just No, I, I was uh, driving a car like I was driving a go-kart and the motorcycle like I was... I did in one year. I did one race. The rest of the races, I was <laughs> hurt <laughs> from a crash on the street. So it was crazy. And no drugs, no drink. I never drink in my life. I started to drink wines after I stopped racing cars, you know. So, uh, right. and, and even because I started doing a collection with uh, wines, because I never. So I started doing this collection because uh, I said, what else I can invest? So I see a billionaire from Norway. I was looking, I said, hmm. and he was doing a big collection. He do collect a lot of important wines, and then he sell and make more money. And he's a billionaire. <laughs> oh, wow. I said, I guess I do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I start to collect. And I buy, you know, Lafitte, Latour, all the, you know, big uh, 5,000 Petrus, $5,000 Petrus, you know, things like that. And uh, I say, what the heck I'm doing? I'm collecting this. And just because I see Robert Parker uh, mm -hmm. doing the notes and writing about uh, the wines I'm buying. And of course, they are important wines. Uh, so I say, I have to <laughs> start to open to really feel and see what it is and i did uh, and i never sold one bottle <laughs> <laughs> i drink sometimes and and it's great, it's great it seems like a lot of it seems like a lot of former drivers get into the wine business i obviously mario aj's in it now so oh, I don't yeah. know what... mario i knew what he was arciero he, he always say yeah oh, oh i want to give you <laughs> Come with me to Carmel. I say, oh, no, I don't want to go. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never AJ, drank them before. Yeah. I, so think I, we got, I think we got some RCRO wine in, in the fridge right now. Oh, yeah? I think so, yeah. But Frank died already, yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, what long story short. Doing? What his son is doing? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know them. Uh, I know someone who knows them really well. And so that's where that came from. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know what they're doing, to be very honest with you. I think they have been they kinda... the, in the construction business and uh, at the wine business. Right. But I don't know now anymore so what they are doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, AJ. AJ got in the wine business. It's like five years, wasn't it, Scott? Because, so I live... Oh, not, I told you this years, before, yeah. Marco. I, I lived like five blocks from the track and right on Main Street. Main Street's a lot different than since you were here last, but there's a bunch of businesses and stuff. And AJ's got a big shop there and he's got his winery there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pretty big deal. And I like AJ. <laughs> he's For a businessman. Yeah, but he's very, with me, he was very nice. And other people say, oh, no. Be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I never, I just, well, the car is like this. We, he invited me to go to dinner. I mean, he, he never had any, any kind of, uh, no, I don't want to do. And he actually, you look at that. In 1999, I went to Indy to sell all the equipment. Okay. So I did the Phoenix and I said, well, you know, I'm going to sell the equipment. That will be it. So I went there. When uh, four people invite me, oh, no, you have to race, you have to race. I say, no, I'm here to sell my equipment. I don't want to race. Oh, you should do it. Then AJ came to me. Marco, 
come to me in my garage. I went there. I have a, this car for you to drive. Say, so, Jay, I'm here to sell my car. <laughs> I'm not to, to drive anything. No, Marco. Look, how much is your car and the engines? So he bought all the engines in the car sold to another guy. But he said, uh, I buy your engines and, and we see how it goes and I pay you some money. I said, okay. So that was on Saturday. So he, we make a seat and in the end of the day, I was able to give six laps. This six laps was enough for me to qualify. That was in 1999. In the following day, Sunday, I started the day with the Robbie Bill, first car to go out, and I was the second car to go out. He did practice, qualify. I was going out. They say, stop. It's raining in turn three. I say, okay. So they cover me. I have even the picture from the, the journal that uh, uh, I was there waiting. And then uh, it started raining strongly. And that was 11 o'clock in the morning. Then we went back there almost in the end of the day. Uh, six o'clock. Ah, he sh gave the shot that was finished. The sun came out. <laughs> Didn't meant to be. Right. That's the only thought that I say, wow, it's not for me. I, I shouldn't be here. That's, you know, we never know what's going to happen. But I believe in all these things, you know. You never know. I mean, if it's not to be, better don't try too hard because it can be a big problem. And but how come six o'clock the sun comes out there? Right. And it was raining all the time. And that was the last time. <laughs> Would be the fifth race. So that's okay. Yeah, I uh I agree in that uh sometimes if you look around and you're in certain situations, you look around and you think, hmm, this probably isn't right, you know, and, then, and sometimes there's just things that just let you know that, hey, this is not to be, like you said. It isn't meant to be, no. Yeah. So you don't, you cannot force the nature of things. Right. You, know, you, can, you can try harder, but you cannot force the nature of things that uh, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. No, I, I believe that too, yeah. I think the best you can really do with that is really just putting yourself in the right situation and if it's meant to be it'll happen, but you like you said you can't force it. You can put yourself in the right situation, but you can't actually force it to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I need to go there to sign the the wing of the car. It's still there? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it I think yeah, I think it still is. So Scott, um it was funny me and my dad went to um the muse museum like last year, you know that big yellow car that they had all the drivers on? Who me? Oh, you know, no. I'm you remember they it was like the I think it was called the Stinger car. It was like the Window World car and they had like all the starters of the Indy 500 on it and they had all the drivers sign it. Uh was it like the Mormon Wash tribute? Yeah, Is yeah, exactly. Okay. And so they had Marco's name on it. When we were there, I saw it, and his signature wasn't on it. So I took a picture, and I sent it to him. And then he sent it back, and he, like, signed the screen. <laughs> He's like, there you go. Now it's signed. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank I really you. Appreciate I appreciate it, too. It was very nice to talk to you guys. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank yep, you. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. Bye, yeah, Marco. Thanks, Marco. Bye-bye. <laughs>